Good morning, church. So good to be here. Please stand for the call to worship. I'll be reading from Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Here we're reminded of just God's faithfulness to us. Though we are, that we fail, we struggle each day, we know God's mercy is renewed every morning. Let's come before him and just lay down our burdens before him, knowing that our God loves us. Let's pray. Father God, there is no one like you. Even though we fail, Lord, and stumble, Lord, we know that you are with us, that your mercies are renewed every morning. Lord, thank you that you loved us so much too, that Christ died on the cross for us. So we lift this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. My heart turns violently inside of my chest 
I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves. Oh, he loves. And we are His portion and He is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in His eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And heaven turns by my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way. Worthy 
is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free, whoa, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Praise band this morning. You know, they 
every single week dedicated. Thank, thank you so much. Let us pray together. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, once again this, for this awesome privilege to come to your house to worship you, to praise your name in freedom. Lord, Father, thank you for just watching over us this past week. And regardless of whatever transgressions or sins we may have committed, we come to you confessing our sins that we, you may forgive us, Father, that we may be able to receive your message that Pastor Derek will deliver today. Lord, please anoint him and be with him that he speak your words and not of his own. And help us, Father God, to have our hearts and our minds open to receive it and to be able to apply it as we leave today. Father, we pray especially for those that are suffering uh, in health. Uh, we want to lift up a special prayer this morning for our brother Ken Padani, who's going through some uh, blood issues. Lord, Father God, he's been in the hospital. Lord, we, we thank you for the stability that, that he is in right now, and we pray for your continued hands of healing upon him. Father, comfort Bonnie and Ken during these trying times. And please heal him completely that he may be able to come back and worship with us t together. Thank you, Lord, for, for all that you do. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's great to see everyone here as well as many of you that are online. We, also, we especially want to welcome people that are coming for the first time. And just to remind everyone that we have a time of fellowship and food immediately after the service. Just a few announcements today. So hopefully the Bible reading plan is going well. I'm, I'm encouraged by all of the comments and insights that people are posting on the, on the UVerse app. Um, so hopefully you guys can join in and be blessed along with everyone that's participating. Session two of the evangelism class is today. So that's the second part of the three-part series that Pastor Derek is leading us through. We'll be at 12.15. So fellowship first, and then we'll go and um, attend the evangel evangelism class. That was fantastic last week, Pastor Derek. Thank you so much for leading us last week, and um, we, I think we've all been blessed through that. Now, volunteers needed. <laughs> we say volunteers. Um, we're, so Trina as well as um, Natalie are shooting uh, kind of a short video for our 12-year anniversary, believe it or not, 12 years. Um, our anniversary service is fe February 5th. Um, hoping everyone can come out in person for that event. But anyway, we're looking for photogenic or videogenic. I don't know. I don't know what you call it, but we're looking for people to to kind of uh, get on video and you know share your thoughts about the church. If you're not if you're not volunteering, they're gonna volunteer volunteer you guys. So. We encourage everyone that are especially want to share your thoughts about the church. Go see Trina and Natalie. She, they will be going around with cameras today. Um, we didn't make this announcement last week, but water bottles. So we encourage people to bring your own water bottles. They have water stations here where you can get uh, filtered water for drinking. We're just trying to you know, save and protect the environment. Less, less waste, obviously, and less lugging around of water um, bottles ourselves. So, yeah, bring your water bottles. And in fact, we have just purchased uh, these tumblers with the church logos on them. Um, I know Sarah, thank you so much for designing all that for us. It looks fantastic. So that'll be distributed soon. So you'll see probably a bunch of tumblers. That's right. That's right. Um, so, yeah, we encourage people to Bring your own water bottles and save the environment. Uh, lastly, the joint life group meetings. My understanding is all of them are happening within the next week or so. So we encourage everyone to just uh, get together, have a great time, get to know one another outside of your immediate small group. And if you're not in a small group, I encourage you to join one. With that, let me turn it to Pastor Derek. Thank you. Uh, I'm already looking forward to the 12th anniversary for the church. And God laid on my heart the message for that uh, sermon. I've called it the power of 12, man. So we're going to have a good time. I hope you're there. You get a free mug. We have bibimbap. And we're going to, it's just going to be a good, good time. So thank you all again. Pray for Ken. Uh, I was able to visit him and some others. And they just, they're just so, they're relatively new, but they just 
feel the love of the congregation for them. So continue to pray for them, um, and hopefully they'll recover and be back here for church. But I guarantee you right now, they're listening online, and I'm just so thankful. One of the positives out of COVID was a lot of churches are doing some good online stuff, and I commend our church for doing it as well. And we get a lot of people watching, people we don't even know. We're not checking on you. We're not spying on you. But we're thankful that people are watching nevertheless. Well, we're continuing on in our series in the Gospel of John. And we're going to take a two-week break, the Power of 12, two weeks from now. Next week, we have our friend, Pastor Josh Anderson, who will be preaching. I have him coming once a month. You all love him. And uh, so he's agreed to do that. I, I told him, hey, could you preach like, you know, either Palm Sunday or Good Friday or Easter Sunday? You know, that would really help me out. He goes, I can do all three. I'm like, well, no, I think they expect me to do something, right? So he's going to be doing Palm Sunday and Good Friday. So we're excited that he's continuing to preach and be here. So you want to be here next week and then the week after. And then we'll continue on getting into John chapter 3, you're like, how many messages can we do in the book of John? Like 20-something, okay? So this is going to take us through the summer. I know you're all like, really? Yes, really. There's so much there. You're going to see that today. Now, many of you know me. Some of you are new to the church, so, you know, thank you for being here. But many of you know that I got married late in life. And, yeah, I look at my brother who got married at 25, and he's, two years younger than me, and he was with child the first year of their marriage. And now he's a grandfather four times over. I, I'm just amazed. Whereas I have been my 12-year-old son at home, um, and I enjoy him much, but I'm not enjoying the golden years like my brother. And as I thought about it, one of the benefits I have of being an older dad, having a kid at home, is I bypassed midlife, cri midlife crisis. I, I bypassed it because I had no midlife. Therefore, I'm not in crisis, okay? That's one benefit. I remember one time I was going to my wife's office, I don't remember, and, and this guy, relatively old, drives up in a Corvette convertible, man, a good looking car. I told him he had such a nice car, especially when I convert it to my you know, gray Odyssey van. I mean, you know, that's, that's my car. The kids even call it. That's dad's car. It is a man van, so it's kind of cool that way, but it's still a van, you know, lipstick on a pig. It's a van. But I looked at this Corvette and I said, man, this is a nice car. He said, you know, I'll sell it to you for 22000 And uh, I'm like, wow. I looked at my wife, and I saw it in her eyes. The answer, no, sorry, I'm not going to be able to get that car. So I never did the midlife crisis hot car purchase, which is probably good. But there's also another benefit. I'm also not one of those midlife guys that wears those 20-year-old skinny jean type things, because that would be really gross. <laughs> now, for those of us who are thinking about making such large luxury purchases, we realize that all of us, our funds are limited. I mean, if we spend on ourselves, the potential is, is that we spend less on God, right? So we, we change the strategy, those of us who think about that. So instead of making a choice between the secular and sacred, we think, let's just enlarge the pot, make more money, take on another job, make a killing in the stock market, get a spouse to work a few more hours or take on another job. And this way, we can still give to God and still bring home the money for ourselves. But the question I asked when I thought about that strategy is, the point is where we're living for making more money than rather making money to live. You know what I'm saying? I mean, think about it. how much is too much. Some of you guys, I got a number that's so big, it's, it's not going to be too much. I mean, ask Tom Brady. The guy is the GOAT, the greatest of all time quarterbacks. He makes a... Someone shot me. <laughs> I love you all. God bless you. Ben, you get to inherit the dog, okay? Yay! Yay, yeah. That's all he's thinking about, the dog. Okay. Think about it. Tom Brady. Guys, we're tons of million, and he's got a commentary. I heard that, you know, when he finally retires, he gets a quarter million dollars for a contract to 
to, I mean, how much is too much? Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, who was the wealthiest human being in the universe and history of all mankind, but he also holds the record for losing the most amount of money in one year, last year, 2022. Trust me, don't feel sorry for Elon Musk. He's fine, okay? What about us regular Joes? Most of us will never be millionaires, but if we're honest, most of us have been blessed in our careers and, and we've made ample income. And because of this, I think there's this tension between our love for money and material things versus God. And so this morning, I want to look at an instant of Jesus. Most of you know your Bible, probably are very familiar, the cleansing of the temple. We're going to look at it, and I think we're going to learn some lessons about money and God. Before we continue on, let's ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for these dear people, Lord. We pray that you would be with us, be with those online, be with all your believers, Lord, all your children who are going to church and learning more and more about you. Be with us now. Help us to learn what it is you want us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 12 serves as a transition from our last event. If you were here last week, you remember we talked about the water turned to wine. And now we're going to the next momentous event. And this is recorded in the book of John, verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Capernaum actually is relatively close to Cana. We believe it's up in that northern region. But look at what we do. We pick up the text in 13 and 14. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Now, devout Jews from out the entire known world at the time, Europe, Asia, Middle East, even North Africa, they would head to Jerusalem at this time to, to, um, to celebrate the Passover. And those of you who know Jewish history know that the Passover was a reminder of the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. Pharaoh's heart continued to harden as God brought on plague after plague through his servant Moses. But on the 10th plague, do you remember? God told the Jews, I want you to slaughter a lamb. I want you to take the blood, put it on the doorpost. And what will happen is my spirit will come through the land. If there's blood on the post, it will pass you. It will pass over. But all the homes of the Egyptians, I will kill the firstborn. And it was a great deliverance and allowed the Jews to leave Egypt. Now, Jesus went into the temple courts, or what's known as the court of the Gentiles. So you had the temple proper, but then you had the bigger part. That was still part of the temple, but it's called the temple, the court of Gentiles because it was an era where non-Jews could be there. And it was here he saw some selling animals for sacrifice. And those who were less wealthy, they would offer a dove. So you could buy a dove to sacrifice, but the wealthier would sacrifice a bull to God. In addition, there were also what we call the money changers. Remember, these people came from all over the known world. They had different kinds of currencies. Well, they would c convert the currency into the kind that was used for the temple courts. And this is our first lesson that we learn about God and money. That is this. Making money can be a means of doing godly things. For example, those who supplied the animals we're offering a convenience for these pilgrims. Think about it. If you're coming to North Africa, right, or Europe, and, and, and you've got a cow, you want to transfer that? We didn't have pickups. They didn't have trailers or anything like that. And so these suppliers were helping the devout Jews to worship God because all you had to do was bring yourself, get the animal, and then sacrifice it. Uh, as I thought about it, you know, I thought, they're kind of like the modern Amazon, ancient Amazon. You know what I mean? I mean, it's so funny. My, my son got a yo-yo, you know, and, and his string broke. And if you know yo-yos, the string always breaks, right? We bought a 10-pack of strings. Could I go down to the store and buy them? Yeah, but I just got them on Amazon because it's just way more convenient. Well, that's what these money changers and, and, and sacrifice guys were all about. It was a helpful convenience. There, were, by the way, was no exchange currency banks like you see 
in the airports, right? So these individuals were needed so that the pilgrims wouldn't have to spend wasted time trying to convert their cash. But unfortunately, what started out as a means to help others became a way of making a fast buck. And by the way, the religious leaders, the temple guys, the Levites, they didn't mind. You know why? Because they took a percentage of everything that these guys made. And so that gives us another valuable lesson that we learn from verse 14. And it's this, that where money can be made, worship can easily be corrupted. See, the sacrifice providers and the money changers weren't the, were the only game in town. They had a monopoly. And because of the greediness of the human heart, it led to price gouging and exorbitant interest rates. And so helping others worship God became a lucrative commercial venture. And guys, we're kind of, hopefully, we're coming out of the COVID pandemic. But it wasn't very long ago. You guys remember? When toilet paper, you know, I remember when Easter came around and, and we visited members who were, you know, were isolated and didn't come to church. Kath and I had an extra case of toilet paper and we distributed one roll in each of the goodie bags. I had one family, you know, we gave them all goodies. They almost cried and said, thank you for the toilet paper. You know, who would have thought in America we'd be scrounging for toilet paper and Purell and masks, Remember? So what happened during those times? People started to hoard, but others would corner the market on Purell and toilet paper, and they would sell it for like $5 a roll. And that's what happens. Another example, I think you all know during the COVID pandemic, we had chickens in our back. You know, we're in a suburban area of Chandler. And we got two coops, and, and they were happy, six chickens. But one of the neighbors was not happy because our chickens would walk along the fence. And they, they, they squealed on us. And, and City of Chandler came by and said, you're not allowed chickens here, right? So we gave them away to a, a family in our church who has a, a more you know, rural area that they could raise those chickens. But guess what? Chandler's the only one that does not allow for chickens in the back of all the other cities, Mesa, Tempe, they allow Phoenix. But just the beginning of this year, January, the board, of, uh, board, the city council passed a thing that said you can have chickens. And I said, I don't want chickens again, man. They poop all over the, the, you know, everywhere and everything. But I'll tell you, man, now the eggs are $5 a dozen, we're getting chickens. I don't know why the price of everything went up, but it makes it really hard to live, right? Well, where do we see this mentality today from a spiritual perspective? Well, obviously, I think we see it in the, in the Christian holidays, Easter secondarily, but especially in Christmas. I mean, we take a holiday that is set aside for God, right? And then the world commercializes it. And I'm not suggesting that you and I at Christmas don't buy gifts for others or put lights up or anything like that, but we certainly don't need to overdo it. And there are many godly Christian programs that are used in the world to encourage a lot of people. But to be honest, if you look at these programs, it takes a lot of money. And back when I was a younger man, I appreciated a pastor, his name's Chuck Swindoll, who was well known to have a radio ministry back in the 80s, I think, and, and beyond, called Insight for Living. And I listened, it, and it was a wonderful ministry. But early on in his career, there were many who were saying, forget radio, that's not the medium, we gotta go to television. And he said no, for two reasons. Number one, he said, it's too expensive. Radio relative to TV, TV is way more expensive and will spend too much time begging for money. He didn't wanna do that. But the second was, he says, I have a face for radio. <laughs> you know, he, he, says, he goes, you know, the problem with when you do TV is you start to think about what you look like and how you present yourself. And, you know, I think Joel Osteen, he's got some issues with his teeth. He gets braces, you know, stuff like that. And I see it in my own life here with this church. Once we started going online and I watched a few of the videos, I'm like, dang, that's what I look like? That's what I'm wearing? Oh, my gosh, I wore that shirt, you know, 
just a week later, and all of a sudden, I'm looking like, I got to bury my wardrobe. Oh, man, my forehead's shiny. I better make sure I get powdered. Oh, my goodness, I got to, you know. There's only one time I use hairspray. It's Sunday morning to make sure my hair doesn't do what it does through the rest of the week. That's what happens when you start thinking about these things. And I don't want to. God doesn't mind us making money. Money can be a good thing. And Jesus didn't mind the presence of the sacrifice providers and money changers in the temple court. What he minded was the abuse and corruption of the system. So the question is, how do we prevent ourselves from getting into the same thing, getting enamored by money? Well, we find it in verses 15 to 16. It says, so he made a whip out of cords, drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here because you've turned my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered from the psalm, zeal for your house will consume me. You know, I'm reminded of my church in California. It would be considered a mega church at that time. And they put on this Christmas presentation, and they did it five times a year using real live animals. I remember we would have a donkey. Someone owned a donkey in the congregation, and they would use it for, for this event. And, and, and Mary would sit on the back of the donkey, you know, kind of like this, and, and Joseph would be moving her along. And, and the, <laughs> I found out later maybe it would be abuse, Natalie, I don't know. But they said to make sure this donkey didn't buck her off, they kind of medicated him to kind of like just go walk in and walk out. But we had like sheep and goats and everything like that. And this was the old day when there wasn't, there wasn't wireless technology, right? So with microphones on the stage, they would try to disguise them. I remember the shepherds would have this long staff and the microphone would be at the end. And so the guy would be talking at the end of his staff. It, it looked really cheesy at the time. But I remember one time when one of the guys said, you know, I think God is telling us to go to Jerusalem. Should we go? And all of a sudden, one of the sheep in the back behind the curtains went, bah, like that. He goes, I think that's a sign from God that we're to go to Bethlehem. You know, and it, it was fun. One time, though, they left the back door open. And all the animals, including the donkeys, got out into the main street. Think Warner Road or Alma School. And there's sheep and goats and, and cattle and, and whatever out on the streets. It was crazy. That's what happens when you try to do something good for God. Now, some of you might say to yourself, meek, mild Jesus, the son of God, gentle, kids love him. Could he ever get angry? Well, I think from this text, we realize that Jesus does get angry. He makes a whip out of cords and starts chasing everything and everyone out of the courtyard. That seems like anger to me. But here's the question. Was Jesus in sin when this happened? And my answer is no way. He was not in sin. He had what we call a righteous anger because the offense was not against him. I mean, he took a lot of offensive things done to him. They wanted to kill him. They, they were accusing him of wrong. They were doing all that. He didn't care so much about that. What he was bothered was that the offense was against God. In most cases, if you and I were really honest with each other, when you and I get angry, why are we angry? Because a friend or family or kids or boss or client, the driver speeding by you, cutting you off, they offended me. It's because we're wrong, not God. And I want you to note that Jesus didn't protest the sacrificial system, but rather the turning of his father's home into a marketplace. Imagine if we took this church our church, and after the service of before, we had a flea market, you know, selling goods. And herein lie, uh, lies one way that you and I can help us put money in its right perspective. Understanding God to be our father will give us a proper focus. God's our father. What were the words that Jesus said? How dare you turn my father's house into a market. My father. Do you realize how intimate that was? Jews back then didn't call, call you know, God my father. 
And I don't know if you own a gun, uh, a sword, any means of personal protection. I don't know if you're a Second Amendment rights activist or if you're a pacifist. But I do think that most of us, if you were to bring physical or the potential for physical harm on my family, and especially my kids, I will do whatever it takes to protect them. And you may not particularly like one of your family members, but most of us would defend them against anyone who would badmouth my father, my mother, my siblings. And you might have a strained relationship with one of them, your brother or sister. But I guarantee you, if someone tries to take advantage of them, we will be the ones to get all over you. And when my grandmother was taken advantage of by a tenant, I took the court guy to court. If someone says something inappropriate to my sister, uh, they're going to know that I'm not happy with it. And so would you. And here's the point. If that's the way you and I are with family members, shouldn't be even more so with our Heavenly Father? We jealously guard our family's interests against others. Should we not be more concerned about God's interests? But we won't. And we don't. We look out for our family's interests, but not God's. You're walking down the street or you're, you're in a place and you hear someone cursing, uses Jesus' name in vain. Do you say anything? Someone bad mouths the church saying, we're all about money and hypocrisy. Do you defend the church? Someone says, oh, come on, you don't really believe the Bible. Man, it's a book of fables. How do you respond? Some of you send money to your parents. You look out for them and moving them to a new home. You give them rides, send them gifts, call them frequently. And so you see your money, your wealth, your reason for doing that based on what your parents did for you, how they loved you. But what about our Heavenly Father? If you and I have a proper understanding of God as our, ultimately, our ultimate Father, it should radically change the way we view ourselves, our wealth, our time. Because we realize it belongs all to God, right? And so the disciples recalled Psalm 69, 9, when they thought of Jesus. Zeal for your house will consume me. Let me ask you, does zeal for your house, does zeal consume you? Does your love for God the Father consume you? I love that word consume. Last night we were, the elders met over at John and Janice's house, which quite frankly is always a joy. Not, because, not only because I love the fellowship in there, but John just cooks like amazing food, right? Last night it was tri-tip. Awesome. Sorry, Natalie, but it was really good. She's a vegan. That's why I could say that. We're going to do vegan tri-tip. I don't know what it would taste like. I don't know what it looked like. But, but it was wonderful. I thought of that for consuming. But, you know, there's another consuming. And that idea I thought about, it's like fire, right? Because when fire takes hold of something, my, my son and I were out in the beehive fireplace, you know, trying to get a fire going. And then we got it going. And then it's just like really burning hot. That fire consumes all organic matter. And so I thought about that. Do you and I have this all-encompassing passion? You won't let it go. Do you have it? Jesus had this passion regarding his father's interests. And by the way, it eventually led to his death, right? But here's the irony. That consuming fire of passion that we have for God doesn't mean that we need to die for God. It doesn't mean we need to die for Jesus. In fact, it means the exact opposite. The all-consuming passion we have for God, what God wants us to do is live for him. To give our all-consuming passion to him. There's another spiritual truth about money that comes from verses 18 to 22. Then the Jews demand him, what miraculous sign can you show to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, I love this. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? 
but the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, the disciples recalled, recalled what he said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. You see, the religious leaders at this point just saw an incredible act and an individual cleaning out the temple. And they knew their Hebrew scriptures. And they knew that this was a sign, a messianic sign. It would have demonstrated Jesus' religious authority. And so they question it. Is Jesus the Messiah? And the religious leaders in verse 18 want to know. And so they ask proof. Show us. Prove to us that you're the Messiah. And they would have expected him to give an answer. Well, I'm going to overthrow Rome. Or I'm going to perform some miracle that will convince you that I have that authority. But he didn't. He instead made this enigmatic statement. Listen to it. It's up there. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. In the Greek, it is an imperative. It's a command. He's not saying, listen, he's not saying, I will destroy this temple. He's making a, com a command. Destroy this temple, meaning you destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And by the way, that's a lesson for all of us, and I've decided in the fall, we're going to do a Bible study on how to study the Bible, because they were not listening to Jesus. He was not saying, I'm going to destroy the temple. He's saying, you're going to destroy the temple. The leaders must have thought he was crazy, because Herod the Great had that temple that Zerubbabel had built 400 years before, rebuilt which was originally built by Solomon, right? The temple had stood for 400 years, but in 20 or 19 BC approximately, Herod the Great decided, I'm going to rebuild this temple. And it would take 35 years later to complete it in AD 63, which by the way, when the Romans came in in AD 70, they totally destroyed it. All that's left, those of us who went to Rome, saw one part, the foundational wall, what we call the Wailing Wall. But that's all that was left. The thinking for the religious leaders at that time was, if it took us this long to build it, and it's still not complete at the time of Jesus, how can Jesus rebuild this temple in three days? And the answer is found right here. We need to see life in spiritual terms, not monetary ones. Because verses 21 to 22 makes it clear that Jesus wasn't speaking of the physical building. They were thinking of the temple. He was talking about his body. He was alluding to his future impending death and resurrection. And given this context, his imperative of destroying the temple makes sense. Why? Because it was the Jews who would kill him. Obviously, at that time, the disciples didn't understand that he was speaking of himself, that they were anticipating his death. And so what John is showing us in this passage is that Jesus understood, even at the beginning of his ministry, even when he was baptized, that this isn't what it's all about. I am heading to the cross. He had the predetermined goal to say, I am marching to my death. I am going to sacrifice myself as the Lamb of God for the sins of the world if you put your faith in me. And by the way, that is the gospel message. And you haven't done that. If you have not placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust that even this morning God is touching your heart to understand it is by faith in Jesus alone that you and I will be saved. Now let's face it, many times we think more like the religious leaders than Jesus, seeing life in monetary terms rather than spiritual terms. And perhaps someday... After 12 years, we're going to celebrate. You know, we're meeting here, and, and quite frankly, Channel of Prep has been very gracious. They've never raised the rent. They allow us to use it. We use the gym. It, it's, it's a great situation. But maybe someday we'll be able to purchase our own church, and we will create a committee to do that. But think about it. What will be the focus of that committee? I think the focus for our elders is spiritual, hopefully. We need to do this because we're growing, and we need this building to be able to do the ministry that we want. But there were some, and, and I understand it, who will think about the money. That will be the determining factor. How much does it cost? How much can we afford, right? Pastor Rick Warren described in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, that God laid on his heart, even during his first service when there were a handful of people, only a handful of people, he said, we will 
build a church of 8,000. I don't know how it came up with that number, but that's the number God laid on his heart. And for years, they moved from church to church, gym to gym, as they kept growing until they finally got their own building. But he never let money get in the way of what he believed God wanted him to do. We have an example of that right here locally, right near us here. The Church of the Nazarene, uh, Ray and 101, the freeway, is a great example. They used to have the property up on Guadalupe, which is now a, a Jewish educational center or something like that. They bought 25 acres right where they are on that corner, on the south, north, northeast corner. But they struggled. I knew the pastor at that time, Mark. He said, we struggled. We could barely make the interest payments. So they, for a few years, they were just trying to hang on. And they decided, you know what? We know God wants us to have this property. So what we'll do is we'll sell the two acres on the front right corner. And so I think it's a dentist's office or something else. And that helped alleviate some of their pressure and help pay down some of the loan. But here's the other thing. This was before the 101 existed. City of Chandler annexed two or three acres along their west side and took the land. And they gave them enough money so that between the five acres of land that they gave up, it paid off the entire loan. I mean, <laughs> that's God's math, okay? You buy 25 acres, you give up five, and you own the whole rest of the 20 acres outright. That's how God works. If you and I count money, we're going to like, no, this is impossible. We can't do it. But in God's economy, it works. And those of us who see life in spiritual terms know that's how God works. There's one last point, I think, that's very important right here. Don't elevate your importance because of your wealth or notoriety. Look at what it says right here. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw miraculous signs. He was doing and believed in his name. You would think Jesus gets big-headed because of that, but no. It says Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. The text goes on to say that Jesus was doing these miraculous signs during the Passover week celebration, and many believed his name. And He's gaining notoriety. He's gaining fame. He's making a name for himself. And you want to know a little secret? Okay, as a pa- I've, I've done this now for... 30 years. I'd like to have a name for myself. I like people to call me pastor. I, I want them to know I make things happen and say, man, you're the man, pastor. We love you. And you know what else? Most of you, you're honest. You want to be thought of like that too. Not as a pastor, but yeah, you're the person. You're the one. Professional athletes are all about it, right? It's all about themselves and how good they are. Movie stars have it. Politicians have it. Big-time preachers have it. And they don't want just 15 minutes of fame. They want constant, unabiding, crowd-cheering, door-busting fame and notoriety. The problem is, is that with fame, it's fleeting. It comes and it goes. You all remember, this is a long time ago, but remember when 9-11 happened and George W. Bush is standing among the rubble of the Twin Towers with a bullhorn and his popularity just skyrocketed, not only in the United States, even among Democrats and Republicans around the world. He was the icon. He was the man. And then just a few years later, he becomes the GOAT. And I don't mean greatest of all time. I mean literally the GOAT. Nobody liked him. Right? It happens so quickly. Even John McCain, our, our senator, he, he's been a strong presence in the Senate. He's been there forever. And everybody loved him until, I think, for some Republicans, it seemed like he was making compromises. He's even got a terminal named after him, Terminal 3, right? But look at his reputation for some in Arizona. And to be honest, fame just means you're the flavor of the week until people get bored with us and move on to the next big thing. And Jesus knew that his newfound fame was an emotional response, just as temporary. These new followers had faith in him. So long as he was a man, so long as he, it wasn't about saving faith, it was popular faith. Because these same people would turn on him when he wasn't the man. And the other three Gospels record that at the end of his ministry, 
he cleared the temple. And some have said, is there a problem, John? He didn't get it right? No, I think there were two clearings. This one happened at the beginning of his ministry. And here's the, here's the point I want to make. If it did happen at the beginning of his ministry, you would think people would remember this two and a half years later when he clears the temple again. But they forget. He's not the flavor of the month anymore. They did not take him seriously. Now, don't get swayed by the fame, notoriety, and power that wealth and money bring you because you might be dismayed to find out that when it is all gone, and some of you have gone through this kind of process, when it's gone, the friends go, the family goes. More importantly, any testimony that you might have for Jesus Christ also goes. By the way, if you come from the Sunday school class, we're going to talk about testimony, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either one, he'll hate one and love the other, or he'll despise one to be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. So let's learn from the sacrifice providers and money changers this morning. Let's put God ahead of ourselves and put the kingdom of God ahead of our own. Now, some of you, especially you younger ones, you see my title of this sermon, you know, um, show me the money. Maybe you don't know where it's from. Before, there was a maverick. Before there was maverick, there was Tom Cruise as Jerry Maguire, a 35-year-old sports writer, sports agent, I'm sorry. And he seemed to embody this attitude of money second and putting integrity first. So he's, he's making money. He's representing all these Sports, and he realizes it's wrong, and so he creates this mission statement, and he tells all the people around him, we got to put people first. We got to do all this thing. You'd think that that was a good thing. What happens? The cynical company fires him, and he realizes he's being fired. And if you know the scene, he's calling up, you know, athlete after athlete, trying to get them to sign with him personally. And they all said, I'm sorry. They went when they. Finally, there's only one guy left Rod Tidwell, played by Cuba Gooding Jr. And and why this might mean something special for us Arizonans is this. Remember what team he played for? Yeah, the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> You're like, yeah, he wants the money, and he's going to get it from the Cardinals? No, it's not going to happen. But there's this one thing his agent and him, and, and he's talking to Jerry. And I love this. I, w I wish I could play the tape. But it's, it's Cuba Gooding, and he's talking to Jerry McGuire on the phone. And he's saying, Jerry, it's something very personal. A very important thing. Heck, it's family motto. Are you ready, Jerry? I want to make sure you're ready, brother, because here it is. Show me the money. Show me the money. It's such a pleasure for me to tell you that for the first time. Jerry, say it with me right now. Show me the money. And you hear, you know, I mean, Tom Cruise, show me the money. Because for him, that's what it was all about. And Jerry pushes back. And tells to, well, you know what the problem is? You're all about the money, but it's really about your heart. It's about what's important to you. In the end, both grow as human beings. McGuire learns that love and integrity are more important than wealth and fame. And he marries Renee Zellweger, I can't even say it, Renee Zellweger, right? And she says this line, and I swear, every woman who hears this line is like melts, because this is how we feel about, you feel about your husbands, right? I love him. I love him. I love him for the man he wants to be, and I love him for the man he almost is. Gosh, guys, I don't think that's what we want to hear, but that's the way it is. There's another one where he comes in, he's begging her, and, you know, just kind of fumbling around, and she's, you had me at... Hello. Remember that one? Anyway, the point is this. Tidwell learns that money is the result of hard work, not in spite of it. And I think that's the lesson for all of us. We put God first, and then everything else works out. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we think about that right now? Lord, we laughingly talk about showing the money, but Lord, you have shown us the money. Most of us we were talking about third world countries this week. We have more money than most people in the world. And yet we're still not satisfied. We want more. But help us to put your kingdom and you first. And then everything else will work out. We're going to thank you ahead of time for that. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Please stand if you're able. Watch, watch Jerry Maguire. It's a great romantic movie, okay? For the rest of us, ah, what can I say? Good to have you all here. Please join us for food afterwards. We're going to have a great time. And again, come in two weeks especially. These mugs are cool, man. They're really cool. And, and we're going to have a great, great time. Father, thank you for the fact that you love us so much. That in spite of the fact that we fail you over and over again, we will strive to love you more and more and put you first in our lives. Help us to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord. Please stick around. We'd love to say hi to you.